Okay, good morning. Uh, my name is Brooke Elias. I've worked for Sarasota County Natural Resources and Parks for over 20 years. And I currently have the privilege of managing an 85-acre coastal scrub remnant. And we are very grateful to Professor Everham for setting the stage for us this morning and going over all the theoretical ecology. Uh, we appreciate uh, him especially emphasizing the challenges. Um, specifically, I would say that the area we are managing uh, is definitely evolving into a novel ecosystem and we approach each day with desperate optimism that he referred to. Uh, our title is Sex and Survival in the Suburbs. We are essentially going to be giving you an overview presentation that looks at all of the aspects influencing the family dynamics of our two remaining Scrub J families. Hopefully by looking at all of these various people, habitat, and wildlife aspects, we then interweave these into a tapestry that we could use as a guide going forward to know what we can best do uh, with these novel approaches. Shamrock Park is uh, located in southern uh, Sarasota County, pretty much the northern boundary, northwest boundary of the Charlotte Harbor watershed. The outline of the park is, is on the right there and um, essentially what we're going to go over today is a little bit of everything. We could have uh, paraphrased Woody Allen, everything you wanted to know about scrub jays, but we're afraid to ask. Um, some of the background, Florida's history, how coastal scrub is different, how being in an urban and suburban park provides even more constraints, and again, looking forward as to how we can help keep these birds thriving. So on that note, uh, I would like to introduce one of the main components that is helping with this effort, and that is our outreach and volunteers at the park. Kate Berduis is a master naturalist. She leads lots of our monthly walks and is a very dedicated monitor for our Scrub Jay families. Well, thank you, Brooke. Yes, I, I consider it a privilege to work with the park and certainly to work with the Jays. So I'm going to take us through a little of the, the history, learning a little bit about the Jays, and then hopefully looking to a positive future, but time will tell on that. Is it which button is it, honey? This one. Okay, so you've heard it described. We have two scrub jay families. The technical term for that is sink, which brings to mind the image of everything going down the drain. We've chosen a different approach. We have chosen the little Dutch boy approach. We are going to keep those birds alive. Help will come. We might not know yet what that help is, but where there's life, there's hope, and that's what we're going to do. Yeah. So that is our mission. We are going to keep these birds alive. And there are three components. We're going to uh, manage the land. We're going to keep the birds alive. And the cavalry will come. So this I've heard this question several times today. Well, why bother? Well, Cornell considers this the, this is the post bird for species of the century. So it's got to be pretty important. Not everybody feels that way, however. And these are actual quotes that I've had to answer and address. And we're going to use these as teachable moments to help explain uh, what our challenges are and how we might answer them. So first of all is, this <laughs> people hate those birds. Well, are they mean and they nasty? Well, no, we have a list of, um, on the list on the right-hand side, all of these descriptors were taken from scientific journals or from uh, regulatory papers. These are not scientific terms. These are really engaging bird, birds, but I think the, the real thing is that for people like myself, I'm not a scientist or a regulator, but once you get to know these birds, you're helpless. You just can't help but love them. So. Ah, yes, well, here's another reason we should care. In 87, 
the bird, our only endemic bird was listed as threatened, but this year things got a lot worse. This is the 100th anniversary of the migratory bird species. Uh, all 1,150 uh, 1, birds were assessed. 400 are on a watch list, and by my count, 24 are listed as in danger of extinction. We have that distinction, extinction. That's hard to say. So, what is the history of the scrub jay in Florida? Well, the fossil evidence says they've been here for two million years. During the Pleistocene, there was an area of a lot of glaciation, and so these birds were separated from their nearest relatives who are the western scrub jay. Now, if you compare the territories of these birds, obviously the western scrub jay has a vast expanse of habitat. I've tried to show it to scale. The Florida scrub jay was never going to have a huge population. The habitat is so small. I did just read recently that the western scrub jay, while it may be the closest genetic relative, the Mexican scrub jay actually has more behaviors in common uh, than, with, than the, the western. Okay, I hate those birds. They ruin real estate values. Well, let's look at real estate. What is the real estate and who has hurt whom? Well, the real estate we're talking about is scrub. Scrub is high, it's dry, it's suitable for agriculture, housing, golf courses, Disney. So folks have come in and grabbed that land, so the existing habitat has been uh, isolated, fragmented, and so that's fine. Okay, so they don't have enough habitat. Well, why don't they just pick up and go somewhere else? Well, the answer is, and I think most of you know this biology, they simply can't. Over the millennia, they have had behavioral and physical adaptations to living in the scrub. We're not going to talk about cooperative breeding, but they have very site-specific requirements in terms of open sand for caching acorns, the amount of low scrub for growing the acorns, the limitation on the number of high trees. But I think the, uh, the behavioral adaptation to spending so much time on the ground is these birds don't fly far. They, they have lost that physical ability. So in 1929, Hiram Bird, uh, he was an infectious disease specialist, president of Florida Audubon, first noticed that the scrub jay population was declining. Now Hiram's wife, Mary, asked that on her death she'd have a, a full body burial at sea so that her body could feed the little fishes that would feed Hiram's beloved birds. And in fact, they did follow her wishes. So things were pretty quiet for about 40 years, uh, during which time the population of Florida started to explode, quadruple. And in 1969, Gene Wolfenden was at Archbold, and he observed that more than two birds were feeding nestlings. And it caught his attention, and it, came, it stayed his, one of his obsessions for life. And he actually, in his obituary, as in his survivors, listed families of scrub jays survive him. So he started this as in its 47th year. We just saw Reed Bowman, John Fitzpatrick. They continued the study. It's been very thorough, exhaustive. What are the results? Well, the grim. They're actually very grim. The population is in, um, it's just plummeted. The number 6,000, I don't believe it's truly accurate. This number is expressed in percentages, and it's always on a kind of a sliding scale. So I don't really know what the number is. If anybody knows, I'd be happy to learn that. But also the habitat has been fragmented and these, these populations are isolated. They are living in genetically isolated islands. Oh, okay, this is my particular favorite one. The people at Shamrock Park are killing those jays. So, one of the people who's killing the jays is, is uh, Brooke. Okay. 
Yes, I've, I've actually had patrons come up to me and say I'm personally responsible for wiping out uh, the last remaining families and killing gopher tortoises and killing all the trees in the park. But as most of the people in this room know, land management is one of our key tools for being able to restore scrub habitat. So uh, uh, some of the constraints we have on Shamrock Park are that we are just south of the city of Venice. And as Kate pointed out, coastal areas are prime real estate. It has been fractured. We are limited with smoke control and other things like that for the prescribed burns we can do for this habitat. And because we are always having new people moving into coastal Florida, it is a constant challenge to be providing the outreach and education necessary for people to know what we need to do for scrub habitat. So here are aerials for Shamrock with the park outlined. You see in 1948, there was no infrastructure, but you can see how much open, bright sand there was. We probably had hundreds, if not over a thousand acres of uh, coastal scrub and scrubby flatwoods. Fast forward to 1960, there's still no intracoastal waterway constructed, but that would happen very shortly after. They dug that to the depth of about 15 feet with the spoil being placed on both the east and west sides. So go to the final map in 1995, which is the year that Shamrock Park was constructed, and you can see the footprint of uh, the park. It was intended to be a fairly high-use recreational park, but when these listed species like tortoises and scrub jays were discovered, we realized that we had to make this a very special natural areas park to balance both the needs of the wildlife, the habitat, and the folks. You can see where our north and south families are uh, on that map, the, the territory to the north and the south. Of. Uh, so vegetation reduction. For many years, we, we totally acknowledge we have not been able to provide the necessary recurring land management and burns that it needed. So our main tool at this point in time is vegetation reduction so that we can get it down to the lower levels, reduce the number of large trees per acre, and hopefully get it in a safe fuel load reduction to have controlled prescribed burns. Uh, we keep careful, uh, so, sorry, careful logs of uh, all of our activities over the years. Uh, and let's see, where is my... <laughs> okay. We do it. We have to do a lot of outreach for our land management just to try to counteract the criticism we're going to get. These are very small burn zones. This one's about two and a half. This one's about four. And these, this area and this area were the ones that we targeted in January and February of 2015. So as we all know, Smokey the Bear got it wrong with preventing. We uh, need fire, absolutely, or this habitat, this park, will continue to grow up into mainly cabbage palms and pine flatwoods. So all of uh, our scrub species are adapted, and very many are absolutely dependent. We see lots of things coming back, including our keystone species. We have a very healthy gopher tortoise population of all ages at the park. And just recently, we discovered the Florida box turtle also uh, making its home there after our land management. So I referred to the reduction we had in the winter of 2015. We went in with the Browns tree cutter, and you can see how constricted we are. That is a um, major a uh, regional trail in the background of that called the Legacy Trail and the Venetian Waterway Trail that goes right along the Intracoastal, which is just beyond that sidewalk. Very heavily used by cyclists and exercisers. Uh, when they go past this and it looks like a moonscape, you know, the phones start lighting up at the county call center. Uh, we had so many large trees on the areas that we were targeting to restore. We, need to ha we needed to call our crew in, many of whom are here today, because it takes a village to restore scrub with chainsaws to cut and remove palm trees, grapple trucks, take out oak trees, chip them up. So we're really struggling here. 
But because of that, we were able to conduct a prescribed burn on one of the small zones right along the Intracoastal Way in December of 2015. You can, again, see the sidewalk that's a regional trail, how we do a lot of um, uh, preventive outreach. We mail postcards to all of the adjacent neighbors in advance of either clearing or burning. And we make sure we have a lot of staff stationed along the perimeter of the burns and our trails to answer people's questions or concerns about smoke. By the way, it was just north of these zones that we targeted for vegetation reduction and burning that our most successful North family has its nest for the past two years. They almost literally followed behind our heavy equipment operator because they are curious, intelligent birds picking up grubs from the soil and just sort of evaluating, hmm, this guy might be doing something good. This might be a good place to live. So that's what it looks like four weeks. Go ahead. That's what it looks like in six months. And to the untrained eye, you wouldn't know that the, we had crushed and, and mulched everything down and burned it. And that's an, an <laughs> So it, this is simple, right? You could do it like a cookbook. Uh, chop and clear, burn, recover, repeat, and everything will be hunky-dory for your burns, uh, for your birds. If only it were that easy. So some of the lessons we've learned, and it goes back to what Professor Everham said. Um, this, this, they didn't read the book. This isn't following what all the field research from Lake Wales Ridge is talking about. We need to be doing this on a rotation cycle of uh, approxima approximately every five years or with all the moisture and, and vegetation we have along the coast, it's not going to stay conducive for them. Uh, we've also learned that the, both the scrub jays and the vegetation come back much more rapidly and, um, and that the, the birds seem to respond to these actions. So, my personal challenge is how to balance everything as a single employee at an 85-acre park that has these amenities. Uh, we, just in the past two years since I've been working there, we've seen a tremendous increase in requests for events, whether it's from cyclists, special events. Uh, I, I will point out we're not being invaded by um, empirical star troopers, uh, storm troopers, is that what they're called? Uh, that is an action figure, but we do have drones out there, and we do have a nature center to hopefully keep engaging the younger generation to teach them about the value of the habitat. So we are keeping all of these things going, uh, but on any given day, uh, it's hard to know what I should be working on. The hole in the men's room floor, uh, invasive exotics like the black spiny-tailed iguana, uh, the tortoises, uh, or, or whatever might need our attention. So it is a true challenge. And that's where we feel our main emphasis, along with the prescribed burning and land management, will absolutely need to be education, training, and outreach because we have a lot of illegal feeding and people literally loving them to death. Signs alone aren't working. We have lots of great signs. The fine print on the bottom of that does point out a maximum fine of $500, and yet right underneath this sign is where that person picked up peanut shells from people feeding them. So we need to educate the public to just leave them alone. Scrub jay parents know that grubs, spiders, invertebrates have a lot more nutrients, higher protein, less fiber than the peanuts or Cheetos that people are feeding that could actually sit in a hatchling's gut undigested and cause them distress or not to thrive. And so, is it really worth it? We've been saying this since the first speaker, uh, overgrown there. They will still try to build nests there, but it's not going to work with all the predators we have there. So why do we really bother with habitat management? I'm going to turn it back over to Kate. Let my husband in there for scale. <laughs> so, as Brooke said, it's, they're, not, they're not sulking and they're not going to breed there. No, they keep trying to breed. But where it really happens is their behaviors in 
uh, optimum habitat versus overgrown habitat really hits the road in the survival of their offspring between one and a half, two and a half for uh, optimum habitat and a completely non-sustainable um, rate of, of breeding. So what's going on in Shamrock? As we said, we have two, two, two families. They're quite different, and we are really at the little Dutch boy time. Are we? Yeah. All right, the South family, they're, um, they haven't had a successful breeding season for some years now. This year they had at least two, maybe more. The first nest was predated. The second nest uh, was found uh, by Nancy Edmondson, those of you who know her. Um, Eagle Eye Nancy, they built a nest in a scruffy tree in an island in the parking lot next <laughs> to the tennis courts. Now, there must have been some good reasons for this. We, we monitored this nest daily, but unfortunately, the nest was predated uh, shortly before we expected them to fledge. Their last successful fledgling is this handsome bird on your left, silver blue lime white. Now, he uh, stayed with his parents for a few years, but during that uh, the mechanical chop that took place in the spring of 20, 2015, the winter, he made his move. The North family that existed at that point said, well, I'm going to go to Casperson. I'm going to go visit Kathy. So I'm going to go over there. They all went over, but they left behind a single female who the year before had dispersed from South Venice Lemon Bay, 1.9 miles. These two birds made their move very, very quickly, and they established themselves as the breeding Pair. One fledgling that year, we named him. It's not a good idea to name a fledgling. He did not survive. This year, we've had a little more luck. They have two fledglings. These fledglings are very healthy. They were born quite early, um, very vigorous, lots of great bold behavior. What they are doing, and this is driving us slightly crazy, is they disappear for long periods at a time. Where have they gone? Well, we, we know now that they are going back and forth between Casperson and Shamrock. Whether this is actually budding, the, uh, the thing that uh, the jays will do to attach an adjoining uh, territory, or whether they're just saying this used to be the North Territory, we're going to expand, we don't know what they're doing. Um, but what we do know is that they're very bold. And it takes bold birds to survive. It takes bold birds who um, can really, well, they can't adapt, but who can manage different situations. So these are very, very bold birds. I was able to track them down after being about five weeks. Oops, I don't want to fall off the stage. This is late June. This is one of the fledglings in late June. This is the female, silver blue, azure, azure. And this is silver blue lime white, this is male, female. And this is last Saturday. And I got nothing but horrible photographs. This is the best I could do. But we can see that this unbanded bird is now getting almost completely adult plumage. This is a little brown down the back. They're just very, very confident birds, which leads us to the conclusion that we've, uh, we're doing Thanks to the county and Brooks' diligence, we're doing exemplary land management for the birds. We're producing bold birds. But what are we still missing? We're still missing the education and outreach to get people. Um, Brook can't be everywhere. I, I'm not there every day. But to recruit members of the public who will, if they see someone feeding the birds, they will then come along and say, Oh, you love the birds too, but maybe you could love them in this different way. And we have a program that we're starting to flesh out to do that recruitment. And so, if we can get all of these elements in place, this is what this is, we're reaching for the stars here a little bit. The hope is that next century's species of the century could still be the scrub jay. So, Thank you. any questions?
Do you know who the predator was? What species predated on the earlier nests? Uh, the, the south family nest this year, I just happened upon on one of our fire breaks an adult uh, scrub jay on the ground chasing a yellow rat or corn snake. And that was right around the time when their first initial nest this season, this past year, would have been in place. So we, we, took, we had a slide in here and took it out that listed all of the predators we have at Shamrock, but the main ones that we suspect for targeting scrub jays and fledglings are snakes, Cooper's hawks, uh, and perhaps other reptiles. We have not documented that our iguana population uh, is climbing trees or predating eggs or hatchlings. But we also have a program in place to control those numbers and professionally remove the iguanas. Okay, the, the question was, do we have a feral cat problem? And uh, knock on wood, the answer right now is no. You'd think we would. We are surrounded on, on two full sides of the park by backyards and uh, established housing development. But ever since the coyotes <laughs> have moved in, you know, life's a balance and things become cyclical. So no, nobody is feeding stray cats and, and we do not have a feral cat problem. 